Take off your disguise Whoever told you Ain't worth the fire Cross tells a story I've changed your mind Cause there's only love in the heart of God No room for shame in his open arms There's beauty
Well, good morning. Welcome to Grace Church this morning. We are glad that you are here on this Memorial Day weekend, and it's such a blessing to have you here. We're excited to have you in this service in particular, as we've got some baptisms coming up at the end of the service, which is always an exciting thing to celebrate. Uh, Folks stepping forward to say, I have new life in Christ, and I want to tell my church family uh, that I'm a follower of Christ. And so that's going to be coming up. We're excited about that. Uh, also, welcome to all of you who are joining us online. We are glad that you're able to join us in that fashion. Uh, we want to tell you about a couple things uh, before we get to our announcement video today. Uh, first is that many of you know um, that uh, Dirk Dreyer, one of our longtime members here at Grace, passed away uh, about a week ago, and we are going to have next... Uh, Sunday, right after second service, a reception uh, to celebrate his life, to encourage his wife peace, and to uh, to just be together as a church family, or reflecting and remembering uh, and honoring the life of Rick Dreyer. And so uh, please join us for that. If you want to come, we ask that you bring uh, either a side dish or salad uh, to help uh, just potluck style, and uh, yeah, come and, and celebrate Dirk's life uh, with the rest of us. Um, also want to let you know that uh, we've been off of our normal routine of recording our weekend debrief podcast where we answer the questions that you sent in that telephone number has been on the screen this whole month but uh, we've just been collecting the questions that have come in uh, but we're going to be starting to record again this week so if you have questions uh, please go ahead and text uh, into that number we would love to uh, to answer those questions and it'll be a blessing uh, hopefully uh, for you to to hear those questions get answered uh, also want to let you know that um, we uh, I think we announced it last week uh, that we have a need for a new church bus. Um, this has been a need for a while because uh, the lift, uh, the wheelchair lift on our bus has not been working and it is uh, so old and in disrepair that it cannot be fixed safely. And so we actually have um, uh, some people that can't uh, come to church because they need that wheelchair lift in order to get here. Um, but then uh, recently our bus stopped working altogether and it's to the point now where it is no longer worth trying to repair. And so we are, uh, we have been saving money. We have money set aside for a new bus, but it's not enough to get the kind of bus at the quality we need with the lift that we need. And so if the Lord is laying it on your heart to uh, contribute towards that project so that we can uh, have a better accessibility for, for folks, so we can uh, use it for youth ministry trips and children's ministry and, and just different things, um, you can go online or use the Church Center app. And uh, if you want to contribute towards that, it's on special projects. And then there's a specific uh, tab there for the bus. And then if you use one of our physical envelopes in the chair in front of you, uh, just write it in. We don't actually have a slot on there for church bus. Just write in church bus and it'll go towards that. And we would greatly appreciate any help um, that you can give us in getting a new new bus to serve uh, those in our community. Um, also today, uh, like we said, is Memorial Weekend. And so we want to honor those who have served our country or if you have have a loved one who uh, gave their life um, in service to our country. Would you stand so we can honor you and your loved ones today? Go ahead and, and stand. Let us honor you. Can we show our appreciation to those who have served our country? And will you join me in prayer as we uh, lift up uh, those who have served and those who have lost loved ones in service to our country? God, we thank you so much for the ultimate sacrifice that so many have given over uh, the, the history of our country uh, in service to us, in service to freedom, uh, in service to peace. And Lord, we pray that uh, you would bless uh, those who have served our country in that way, and that today you would especially bless those who have lost loved ones uh, in service to our country. Lord, we, we know that there is no greater sacrifice that someone can give than to lay down their life for a friend, yes, but also uh, many laid down their lives for, for those they didn't even know. And so we thank you for that. And we also thank you for what that points to in the gospel, that uh, Jesus came to lay down his life for us. And so we, uh, we celebrate that today. Lord, will you continue to bless uh, the Dreyer family? Will you lift up peace uh, with the loss of dirt? We pray that next week we would have a wonderful time celebrating his life as we share a meal together. And may many come to support uh, the Dreyer family. Lord, we thank you and praise you for the opportunity we have to gather today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Here's your grace news for the week.
All right, middle schoolers coming up next month, June 16th through June 18th, the Summer Blast. Make sure that you register before June uh, 2nd. That is the early bird registration deadline. Uh, this is for all sixth through eighth graders. It's gonna be a great time. The speakers all lined up. It's gonna be up at Camp Tapawingo. You're gonna be able to enjoy the new dining hall up there. So uh, make sure that you register and it's gonna be a great time. We would love to invite you to our next prayer night. Uh, it's going to be next Sunday night, June 4th, from 6 to 7 p.m. down in the Fellowship Hall. It's just a great time as we just gather together, as we pray as a group, as we divide into smaller groups, as we sing some worship songs. Uh, so join us next Sunday night, June 4th, 6 to 7 p.m. We'd love to have you there. Hey, Men of Grace, uh, coming up this next Saturday is our uh, men's breakfast. Uh, make sure that you sign up for that. That's on June 3rd. And I would love to have you there, time to uh, just be encouraging God's Word, time to fellowship, and a time to enjoy a great breakfast together. Thank you so much for joining us this weekend. We are so glad to have you. Just a couple reminders, if you want to text in a question about anything we talked about today, there will be a telephone number on the screen during the sermon. It's an anonymous text line, so feel free to text any question in, and each week on our Weekend Deeper podcast, we'll be answering those questions. Also, if you want to contribute to the Ministries of Grace Church, you can use the giving envelope and put them in the donation boxes on your way out. We also have an online giving, and you can also give to the Church Center app. Thank you so much for joining us. Have a great rest of Sunday. Good morning. As we move into our songs today, we just have that chance, uh, just a reminder of, um, we sing songs, but sometimes we don't even think about the words that we're singing. And so today, as we sing songs, I want to invite you uh, just to remember what Jesus has done for us on the cross, that, that we can take our burdens, we can lay them at his feet, that no matter what we're struggling with, um, Maybe it's doubts, maybe it's addiction, maybe it's uh, just the weight of, of all the things going on in your life. You can lay those at his feet. And, uh, and so let's stand together and sing out God So Loved the World. Praise God, praise God, 
from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, praise Him for the wonders of His love. Praise God, praise God. Worthy of every song we could sing. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever be. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you. Jesus, the name of all. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you. Holy, there's no one like you. And holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder. Show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. Jesus, the name above. That's the only one who could ever say worthy.
Open up my eyes in wonder. Show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. I will build my life upon your love. It is the full foundation. It is a firm foundation. I will put my trust in you alone, and I will not be shaken. God, we put our trust in you today. We thank you that you are the firm foundation, Lord. You are holy. There's no one like you. Jesus, we thank you that you went to the cross for us. That you are worthy of all praise. Amen. Let's remain standing in honor of God's word, and Debbie's going to read for us today. I have the microphone on. Good morning, everyone. So good to see all of you. We're in uh, Nehemiah chapter 1, and we're going to read verses 5 through 11. I said, Lord, the God of heavens, the great and awe-inspiring God who keeps his gracious covenant with those who love him and keep his commands, let your eyes be open and your ears be attentive to hear your servant's prayer that I now pray to you day and night for your servants, the Israelites. <clears throat> I confess the sins we have committed against you. Both I and my father's family have sinned. We have acted corruptly towards you and have not kept the commands, statutes, and ordinances you gave your servant Moses. Please remember what you commanded your servant Moses. If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the peoples. But if you return to me and carefully observe my commands, even though your exiles were banished to the farthest horizon, I will gather them from there and bring them to the place where I choose to have my name dwell. They are your servants and your people. You redeem them by your great power and strong hand. Please, Lord, let your ear be attended to the prayer of your servant and to that of your servants who delight to revere your name. Give your servant success today and grant him compassion in the presence of this man. At the time, I was the king's cupbearer. Lord, we just thank you for Nehemiah and his um, great compassion for prayer, his great um, need for prayer. He recognized that he was in need of you, Lord, and for his confession, Lord. Thank you that you sent your son for us, Lord, and that you have redeemed us also, and not just the Israelites. Lord, pray that you would be with Pastor Wes as he brings the message this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. And you may be seated. Thank you, Debbie. We are continuing our uh, series in Heroes of the Faith. Uh, specifically today, we're looking at, uh, obviously, Nehemiah. Uh, Nehemiah on the wall. Our main text, uh, we're going to be in Nehemiah 4. Uh, so you can go ahead and, and turn there at this time. Uh, but before we get to Nehemiah 4, there are a few things that we need to, we need to cover to make sure we're all up, up to speed. Um, the first thing I need to ask you... Uh, have you ever been in a situation when, when, the, when time is getting, where things are getting tough, uh, difficult moments in life? Uh, if you can think back to if you were ever in high school sports or whatever, you had that one coach that was kind of like, all right, now's the time to dig in and dig deep and, 
give it all you got. They were the ones to kind of give you that motivational speech to, to get you moving, right? Sometimes in life, we, we need those little one-liners to kind of kick us in gear, to give us some motivation to get going. And um, I was thinking through, uh, what, are, what are some motivational type one-liners that we see? Uh, we see it in movies. Uh, this first one from Braveheart, if you've seen that, it says, it may take our lives, but it'll never take our freedom, right? It was the battle cry. They're getting ready to head into battle. Uh, the next one from a famous uh, uh, football coach, uh, uh, Vince Lombardi, he says, I firmly believe that any man's finest hour, the greatest fulfillment of all that he holds dear, is that moment when he has worked his heart out in good cause and lies exhausted on the field of battle, victorious. And then we have another famous coach who was known for his motivational speeches, mo- uh, noted for his one-liners, Coach Lou Holtz. And he says, ability is what you're capable of doing. Motivation determines what you do. Attitude determines how well you do it. You know, these are the, the one-liners, the things that are on posters. And, and really, as we head into our uh, study today in Nehemiah, uh, Nehemiah has several of these, like they could be posters of Nehemiah said this. They are real motivators for us. Um, but before we get there, so hang on to that. We're going to get to that point. We need to kind of back up a little bit. If we jumped right into chapter four, it's kind of like jumping into the middle of the story. And it'd be like, okay, that makes sense. But we lose the full effect of what Nehemiah is going through and what he's really trying to do. And so where we're, we're going, and this is going to be quick, and so if you're like, well, that sounds interesting, I want to know more, go home and read it, all right? So we're not going to have time to go into, into greater detail. What I'm covering here, just right at the beginning, um, we could have several messages on. So uh, first thing we need to know actually goes back to the book before Nehemiah, and that's Ezra. In the original uh, writing, Ezra and Nehemiah, was, it was one book. Uh, Later on, when the Bible was compiled, it was split into two. And really what we see in Ezra um, is a return of exiles from Babylon. All right, so, well, how did did the Israelites get in Babylon? Well, a couple things that we've talked about over the past several weeks. The cycle of sin of the Israelites, where things are going well, and then they turn, and they do things their own way, and then they come in captivity and dealing with uh, the consequences of their sin, and then they turn back to God. Well, this was the consequences of a period of time where they turned their back on God, and uh, the Babylonians came in, they destroyed Jerusalem, and they took, uh, they took the, the, the Jews, the Israelites, captive, took them away from Jerusalem, back to Babylon. All right, so that's, when we talk about them being exiled, that's where they were at. Um, then we get into Ezra, and we have a new king that is in uh, over, overseeing the, the land of Persia. So the Persians came in, conquered Babylon, and uh, then is releasing the Israelites to go back to their, uh, go back to their homeland, to Jerusalem. And so they, they go back in, in a couple different waves. Well, King Cyrus is, is the king. Um, over all of this land, and then there are, as far as hierarchy go, goes in, in rulers, uh, there's the main king, and then there's like rulers over the provinces, okay? So uh, King Cyrus recognizes that the Jews, the Israelites, need to be returned to Jerusalem uh, to rebuild their temple, uh, and so he wants to return them. He allows them to leave uh, captivity allows them to go back to Jerusalem uh, to begin rebuilding the temple. Well, an interesting thing happens as we go through Ezra is that as different kings come into power, a lot like what we experience in our political culture in the United States, is you have a ruler that comes in that makes policies and decisions, and, and then another king comes into place, or another president, or another senator, or whatever comes into place and spends the first couple years of their rule or their um, election, uh, undoing what the previous leader did, and then going a different direction. And then another four years, eight years, the same thing happens again. Well, that's what was going on with Ezra and 
and, uh, and the Israelites. So King Cyrus allowed them to go, provided them resources. If you read about it, there was, I mean, great resources that the kingdom was giving them to go rebuild. All the money they needed and supplies. New king comes in and, and, and some of these um, rulers over the provinces would say, well, this isn't a good idea. The Israelites are known to go against the king, and, and we don't want to encourage them. And so the king would say, oh, you know what? You're right. Uh, stop building. And so for a period of time, they weren't allowed to build anymore on the temple. And then a new king would come in, and then they'd say, well, no, we should allow them to build. Go ahead and continue building. Here's all the money that you need. Here's all the resources you need. So this was kind of the story and at, during that time, these rulers in the provinces uh, did not like the fact that um, the, the Israelites were able to rebuild the temple. And we'll get into that as to, as to why. Eventually, the temple was, uh, was rebuilt. Um, they were able to uh, carry out their, um, uh, their sacrifices and um, their offerings to the Lord and, and things seemed to be going well, except Jerusalem was still not where it needed to be. Well, we have, um, and that really kind of gets us to our, um, gets us to Nehemiah. So that was a quick overview of Ezra. Um, hopefully you got all that. That gets us to Nehemiah. Nehemiah um, is, a, um, is an important person. Um, he holds a, a very highly regarded position uh, in the kingdom. So Nehemiah is still in exile. He is in Persia uh, with and serving under King Artaxerxes. Now, Nehemiah is a cupbearer. We might think, well, a, a cupbearer. Cupbearer is someone who just drinks the, the wine or eats the food of the king, and if that cupbearer dies, then they know that the food was poisoned and get a new cupbearer, Right? Well, yes, but there's also more to it than that. Uh, the cupbearer was seen very high-ranking uh, within, the, within the kingdom. Uh, for obvious reasons, he was highly trusted. So the, the, it was, I mean, the king's life is in his hands. Uh, and then the cupbearer also, because they spent so much time side by side with the king, the cupbearer uh, was considered an advisor as well. So it was a very important position uh, one that um, you couldn't have a bad day. Okay? You had to be you had to be on your A game every day. Otherwise, it makes the king very nervous. And if the king gets nervous, then that cupbearer is removed, usually by death, um, and a new cupbearer is brought in. But as Nehemiah is serving in this role, one of his countrymen from uh, from Jerusalem comes back and shares with Nehemiah. Uh, that the returned exiles that are in Jerusalem are in trouble. They're in disgrace. And they say that Jerusalem lies in ruin. And so we have to ask the question, well, why? What's, what's the big deal? We, we see in chapter 1 of Nehemiah that when he heard these words, he, he sat down and he wept and he mourned for a number of days, but he fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Nehemiah prayed. He prayed when he heard of the issues going on in Jerusalem. And it'll be more clear to us as we move on why it affected him so much. And so Nehemiah goes, uh, is, is before the king. And like I said, he, a cupbearer can't have a bad day. But this so greatly affected Nehemiah, the king took notice. The king took notice and was um, like, Nehemiah, what's, what's going on? you something wrong did, did you eat something did you drink something you're not feeling well what's what's going on and Nehemiah was able to share with him about um, what he was burdened with about his people and and again the king would want him to be focused on his ta he has one task keep the king alive and Nehemiah now was thinking about and has have these other things going on in his mind the king and the power of the king could have said you're no longer of use to me. You're done. Kill him. We already see how, through the prayer that Debbie had, had read to us, how God was already at work in the life of the king and in Nehemiah. So the king says, what do you want? 
Nehemiah says, I want to take some time off. This is my paraphrase. I want to take some time off. Go help my, my people to rebuild the wall. King grants that. And uh, the, the king's like, anything else you need? And Nehemiah goes, well, as, as a matter of fact, there is. I would like letters that would give a safe passage. And I would like letters that I could take to the king's forest and get all the supplies that I need to be able to build, rebuild the walls. Big ask. He's asking for time off. The king very much trusts Nehemiah. The king grants him the time off, and he gives him the letters to everyone that he is going to need to get resources from. Here's an interesting thing. This is a very bold ask. How did Nehemiah respond? It tells us right at the beginning uh, in, in chapter 2, the king asked me, what is your request? Very short uh, less than a verse long, so I prayed to the God of the heavens. It was a moment in time the king says, what do you want? Nehemiah doesn't go, mm, let me get back to you. He prayed right then and there and uh, trusted that God would give him the right words to say. The time that Nehemiah heard of the issue in Jerusalem to the time that he asked, king for leave and resources was a four-month period. Four months had gone by. Nehemiah patiently waited for God to work. And how hard is that? Something that deeply moved him, but he had to wait four months. We have a hard time waiting four weeks, four days, four minutes for an answer. Nehemiah was so moved by the issues in Jerusalem, but he had to wait four months. Uh, I love the way Warren Wiersbe um, describes this, uh, his response to Nehemiah's waiting, and really a reminder to us in our waiting for God to act. He says, God is preparing both you and your circumstances so that his purposes will be accomplished. However, when the time, right time arrives for us to act by faith, we dare not delay. See, sometimes there's more things going on than what we realize. And while we get frustrated with the time that we have to wait, and while Nehemiah certainly wanted to get to Jerusalem as fast as he could, he had to wait. And we can look at this and say, God had to have been at work in the king's heart. God had to have been at work in preparing the right time at the right moment. It was not a coincidence. God was at work in preparing Nehemiah and the king to be able to uh, come forward with that request. So Nehemiah is granted leave with all that he needs. And Nehemiah rallies those. When he gets to Jerusalem, he rallies those in Jerusalem and he casts the vision. We read in, in Nehemiah chapter 2, this is our motivation poster right here. He said, so I said to them, he's talking to his fellow countrymen, you see the trouble that we're in? Jerusalem lies in ruins and its gates have been burned. Come, let rebuild Jerusalem's wall so that we will no longer be a disgrace. I told them how the gracious hand of my God had been on me and what the king had said to me. They said, let's start rebuilding. And their hands were strengthened to do this good work. So the question is, why, why build? Why was Nehemiah moved so much that he needed to uh, be down there. Why did it break his heart? And why was he mourning over this and spending time in prayer and fasting? Well, the importance of Jerusalem, we need to understand this, is that from the time that the Israelites left Egypt, they left Egypt, that was, if you remember the story, uh, that wasn't just a little thing, right? God was at work in getting the attention of Pharaoh for them to leave. They crossed the Red Sea, um, not, a, not a small little task. It was a miracle in how God worked. Um, as they moved through the land, they survived the 40 years in the desert. Um, they, as they moved into different portions of the land and conquered people, this was, this was evident, and they were a people that it was very clear that God was with them and that God was doing great things through them. And so everywhere they went, they were known as God's people. And those that dared to stand up against them, uh, we have many accounts to where uh, they failed. 
Uh, we have looked at some of those stories over these last several weeks in the heroes of the faith. And so Jerusalem is the place where, where God had given them land, and, and Jerusalem was a representation uh, of the people of God. It represented um, to the nations uh, who God was. It was a land given to them. And so you can imagine that with this, with the walls destroyed and the city in ruin and that hasn't been rebuilt, it was not a great picture of the strength and the, and the greatness of God. Matter of fact, their disobedience and their scattering point that got him there was not honoring to God and was not representing him well. And so that's why Nehemiah was so motivated. It was motivated because he wanted to make sure that, that Jerusalem was a picture, was a staple that showed uh, who God was and how mighty and powerful he was. And so we get into in chapter 3. Chapter 3 gives us a... Uh, kind of a step-by-step and step showing how they're continuing to build the walls. And all of this time started back in Nehemiah, or started back in Ezra, with the surrounding rulers in the provinces beginning to oppose what was happening in Jerusalem. That continues on through the first three chapters of Nehemiah. There was great opposition that, that, was being, um, uh, that the Israelites were facing. And we're going to dig into that a little bit more and see um, how, how bad that it gets. But before we get there, we've, we've now had just the overview, the quick overview, high level. Here's some snippets. Um, we've covered an entire book and three chapters of the next one. So hopefully you soaked all that in. Uh, before we dive into chapter four and go into a little bit more detail, would you pray with me? And uh, we'll seek the Lord's direction, what he has for us. Father, thank you for... Uh, thank you for this book. We thank you for um, the example of Nehemiah and his faithfulness to you. Lord, I pray that as we go through and we study, uh, Lord, would you, uh, would you open our hearts and minds to um, just understand what it, uh, what, what it means for us? Um, not just the history side of things and, and what's happened in the past, but, but the application to us today. And we thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, Nehemiah 4, if you haven't already got there, I would encourage you to get there. Nehemiah 4 in, uh, in your book, on your phone. We'll have uh, the verses up on the screen as well. The first thing that we see in this chapter is that Nehemiah was faithful to pray. Nehemiah was faithful to pray. We saw that back in uh, chapter 1, verse 4, is that um, he fasted and he prayed. He sought the Lord's direction. Um, he was, uh, Nehemiah was a very intelligent man. He was familiar with the books of Moses. Um, we see that in his prayer in saying he recognizes that when there was sin in our life and our country, um, there would be punishment. But he also called God to remind, uh, to remember them that if they did turn to him, that he would, that he would bless them. And so, uh, and then we see in chapter 2, verse 4, uh, very briefly, before he talks to the king, he says, so I prayed. And then in chapter 4, verses 1 through 5, uh, in our text, we see what is, um, what's being introduced to us here. And, and we're going to get an introduction to some of the people, some of the rulers in the provinces around uh, that were providing that opposition. Chapter 4, starting verse 1, it says, when Sanballat heard that we were rebuilding the wall, he became furious. He mocked the Jews before his colleagues and the powerful men of Samaria and said, What are these pathetic Jews doing? Can they restore it by themselves? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they ever finish it? Can they bring these burnt stones back to life from the mountains of rubble? Then Tobiah the Ammonite, who was beside him, said, Indeed, even if a fox climbed up on what they're building, he would break down their stone wall. And then Nehemiah says, Listen, our God, for we are despised. Make their insults return on their own heads and let them be taken as plunder to a land of captivity. Do not cover their guilt or let their sin be erased from your sight because they have angered the builders. Nehemiah was a man of prayer. Nehemiah showed a great pattern 
of prayer and reliance on God from the very beginning of his planning of going down to Jerusalem um, to where we are in the narrative now. The opposition uh, to Nehemiah and the Jews was starting to escalate. So it started off as, as mocking and, and the, the idea of what are these pathetic Jews doing? And what are you guys doing? Even if a fox goes up on the wall, it's going to break it down. You're not builders. The mocking continues, but the text does say that Sanballat and his crew, they became furious. So it went from attacking their motives and mocking them for what they're trying to do. And when that doesn't work, then they became angered. And we'll get into what that meant for them. But the question is, why the attack? Why is it? So we answered the why they needed to rebuild, but, but why are these, these guys so angry that they're coming to rebuild? I mean, the king has given them permission. The king has given them the resources they need. What is the deal with these area rulers? What's the big, what's the big deal? Well, as we see even in our country, and it comes down to people that we can think of, uh, when we start talking about control and power and money, when those things are threatened, um, there become great issues. Well, that's exactly what was happening with, with these rulers around Jerusalem. A strong Jerusalem would disrupt the balance of power and finances in the area. The king was giving some of his resources that, that meant that he had to take from somewhere and was giving them to the Jews to rebuild the wall. With the, with the walls being rebuilt in Jerusalem, they would become a stronger area, and the rulers around would no longer have as much control. A wallless Jerusalem meant that they would remain weak, and they would remain dependent on the surrounding leaders. But Nehemiah found favor, he found resources, and the, uh, the Israelites were moving toward independence, not reliant upon the rulers around them. Nehemiah's reasoning is that he wanted to bring honor to God. The surrounding rulers were not about what, who God is, and, and they had no desire to bring honor to him. With Nehemiah and a strong Jerusalem, there would be a, a sense of justice in the area. And that is in direct opposition to Sanballat and Geshem and Tobiah, how they operated. They were about all they could get for themselves, and they could get out of the people. It was all about them. The mockings that, that were used, uh, the words that were used by Sanballat and Tobiah cut deep to Nehemiah and the Jews. It was an attack not only on the motive, but on the ability of the Jews. You can put yourself in a situation to where you were moving forward, you know that God has has made it clear in a decision that you need to make and or know you're acting in the right way and your motives are questioned, a lot of times you can't just blow that off, right? I mean, that hurts when you're like, I know my motives are pure. I know this is what I'm supposed to be doing and someone questions your motives. That cuts deep. But more importantly, there's a statement that, that is made by Sanballat and it's a slander against God. They say, will they offer sacrifices? In a sense, what they're saying is, your prayer and your worship, you really think that's going to rebuild the wall? Your God is nothing. Prayer and worship is not going to rebuild the wall, you pathetic Jews. They were, they were attacking the very nature of who God was and slandering him. Those things cut deep into what the Israelites were all about. When Wiersbe says, says that, this implies that it will take more than prayer and worship to rebuild the city. Sanballat was denying that God would even help his people. God's not going to help you just because you pray and worship. It's going to help you rebuild the wall. But how did Nehemiah respond? He prayed. We see Jesus model this in the New Testament when he was mocked, when he was ridiculed. How did he respond? He prayed. 
We see it in Matthew 26, verses 36 through 46. The time where he prayed in the garden. The time where he knew he was going to be handed over. He prayed uh, he, when he was under opposition. John 17, Jesus prays for himself. He prays for the disciples. He prays for all believers. Luke 23, 34, Jesus prays for the forgiveness of those who mistreated him. So under opposition, we see that Nehemiah prayed. Under opposition and mocking and ridicule, Jesus prays. So when we face mistreatment, when we face opposition, when we face difficulties, how do we respond? We should pray. Luke 6, 27-28 says, But I say to you, listen, love your enemies. Do what is good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. Ephesians 6.18 says, Pray at all times in spirit with every prayer and request, and stay alert with all perseverance and intercession for all the saints. Nehemiah was faithful to pray. Jesus was faithful to pray. Let us be a people that are faithful to pray. That leads us to our bottom line, uh, the message that goes through this entire, uh, the, the entire chapter 4, and that is faithfulness to God is the key to a life well lived. Faithfulness to God is key to a life well lived. The second thing that we see from Nehemiah is he was faithful to act. He was faithful to pray. He was faithful to act. We talked about, uh, David had mentioned last week that there are, it, I mean, we should be a people to pray, but at some point, we need to take action. And that is what we see in verses 6 through 14. So it says, Nehemiah says, So we rebuilt the wall until the entire wall was joined together up to half its height, for the people had will to keep working. When Sanballat, Tobiah, and the Arabs, Ammonites, and the Ashdodites heard that the repair of the walls of Jerusalem was progressing and that the gaps were being closed, they became furious. They all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and to throw it into confusion. So we prayed to our God and stationed a guard because of them day and night. In Judah, it was said, the strength of the laborer fails since there is so much rubble. We will never be able to rebuild the wall. And our enemies said, they won't realize it until we're among them and kill them and stop the work. When the Jews who lived nearby arrived, they said to us time and again, everywhere you turn, they attack us. So I stationed people behind the low sections of the wall. At the vulnerable areas, I stationed them by families with their swords, their spears, and their bows. After I made an inspection, I stood up and said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, don't be afraid of them. Remember the great and awe-inspiring Lord and fight for your countrymen, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and homes. Nehemiah was, talk about a poster and, a, and an encouragement. Fight. Don't be afraid of them. Remember the awe-inspiring God. Fight for your countrymen, for your families, for your homes, for your children, for your wives. What Nehemiah uh, what Nehemiah did is he acted upon the prayer. Prayer motivated Nehemiah and the people to move forward in faith that God was with them. It says the entire wall was joined together half its height. Now we're not talking about the wall here just being, you know, the bricks, you know, the little red bricks that we have and they're stacking. Well, we're talking about large stones. And, and when, the, when Jerusalem was destroyed... They were knocked in on each other. And so you can imagine these just massive piles of stone that had to be, had to be moved and stacked on each other. It was to the point where they said, uh, the strength of the laborers fails since there's so much rubble. Like, we're never going to be able to finish this. How can we do this? There were some of their uh, Jews who lived nearby who weren't living within the city, but outside of the city, and they had heard of the attacks that are coming. They'd heard of, of the danger that was coming. And they came into Jerusalem and said, you guys just give up. Give up. Stop your work. They're going to come and kill you. Why work so hard if they're just going to come kill you anyways? Just give up and, and go. 
And that's where Nehemiah's like, mm, enough. Here's what we're going to do. And his action was he put people together. He put families together. And, and if you think about it, if you had a group that is working together, a family unit working together, one, they're not going to be worried about if their family's working on that section of the wall. They're going to be much more effective working together because they're not worried about the safety of their family. Not only that is if there is an attack that comes, they're going to be much more motivated to protect and to fight to protect their family. And so Nehemiah was very, uh, very smart in how he put people together. But I want to give you an idea of just like what were they facing when, when we're talking about building this wall? Like, is it just like a retaining wall? Like, what, what's the size of this thing? So we look at this diagram here, and in the, the dark red section is, uh, is the, the portion of the wall that Nehemiah was rebuilding. There's a, a, a smaller section, uh, a lighter red uh, line that, um, th that may have been part of the wall that was being built later on. Um, and then the dotted uh, dash line on the outside is the wall during the time of Christ. But, but we're really focused on just a section of, of the dark red. And so what was the size of this thing? Well, archaeologists say anywhere from a mile and a half to a mile and three quarters total is, is, the, is the total distance of the wall that's being built. The width of the wall is anywhere from eight feet at the bottom up to somewhere around six and a half feet up at the top. As you continue to read through, um, read through Nehemiah, you, you'll see that the wall was tall enough that they could walk around um, multiple wide, walk around the wall on top. And in, that, in this time in history, most walls were wide enough that there could actually be a, a, a horse and a chariot on top. So these are not tiny little walls. So somewhere around six and a half to eight feet uh, in, in width. The height, 35 to 40 feet. So they had built up to 20 feet, and they're kind of at that point, point like, okay, we're, we're half done. Like, is that, is that good enough? I mean, look at all these rocks, and, and that wall's getting pretty tall. Like, I, I, think, I think we're okay. And Nehemiah's like, no, we have to keep going. But notice what happens. The level of opposition increases from words to threats. The words of the enemies didn't stop the rebuilding of the wall, so they upped it. A plot was hatched to physically attack the Jews. Their very lives were in danger. Some commentators um, have, have pointed out that there were family connections, and I think we covered this a few weeks back, family connections between the Israelites and some of the surrounding rulers and the Ammonites. And so you had some Jews in the area that were kind of playing both sides of the game. Like, I'm going to go to the side that's winning. And so they saw, there were some that saw an opportunity, like there's no way that, that the Israelites are going to be able to battle against the rest, of these, uh, the rest of these rulers. And so they started to develop a plan, and were, um, they were going to be kind of the, the inside, the, the double agents, I guess, that were going to come in and help this attack. Their very lives were in danger. They were surrounded by their enemies. Sanballat and the Samaritans were to the north. Tobiah and the Ammonites were to the east. The Ashdodites were to the west. And Geshem and the Arabs were to the south. They were surrounded. There was no way. They had no hope. How did Nehemiah respond? He prayed. And then he acted. We see that in, verses, uh, in verse 9. So we prayed to our God and stationed a guard because of them day and night. Discouragement was setting in. Fear was setting in. But like a great coach, Nehemiah addressed the concern, and he made a plan. He motivated the people and acted on that plan. Don't be afraid. Remember our great and awe-inspiring Lord. Fight for your countrymen. Fight for your families. Fight for your wives. Fight for your homes. It was the motivational speech that they needed. How could Nehemiah, in the face of danger, and the real possibility of his life being taken, have the courage to motivate the people. He prayed. He had faith that God would protect them. And he acted for physical needs. He addressed the physical needs. He addressed the spiritual needs. He focused the people back on God and his greatness. 
For us, how many times do we, we get in a tight spot and life kind of feels like it's closing in on us and we, we kind of think, oh, things are bad, things are terrible, um, the world's coming to an end and yet we have that one person or we have those people in our lives that say, let's get folks back on God here. Let's remember how awesome God is. Let's remember how God has been at work in your life. Let's remember about the goodness of God, the love of God. All of a sudden, even though our problems are big, they don't seem quite so big because we have a bigger God than our problems. What we see in Nehemiah is a balance of faith and works. Because of the faith Nehemiah had in God, his works or acts, they were evidence of his faith. We see that Jesus modeled this in the New Testament. He acted. Jesus' life was in danger multiple times. There were people that were plotting to kill him. There were people that despised him, wanted to hurt him. And ultimately, Jesus acted in faith to the will of the Father. His action was to go to the cross on our behalf. This is the reason why he came. We see this in John 3, starting in verse 14. It says, Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, so that everyone who believes Him may have eternal life. For God loved the world in this way. He gave His one and only Son, that everyone who believes in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send His own Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through Him. He came so we do not have to fear death. He acted so we do not have to fear the unknown. His action brings life. It brings joy. It brings mercy, grace, peace. That is what is offered through Jesus. If you're here this morning and you don't have a relationship with Jesus... You can't have that joy and that grace and that mercy and that peace. It is only through Jesus that that comes. And today may be the day for you to act on this great news. Today may be the day for you to say, I've heard all this about Jesus. I don't have that relationship. I want that kind of joy. I want that peace in my life. I would encourage you after the service to be with one of our prayer team in the back. Meet with one of us pastors. If you're online, I would encourage you just to, to click on the, uh, the talk to the host. The host that is online would love to be able to share with you as well what it means to have this relationship with Jesus. If you do have a relationship with Jesus, be reminded of what we do have in him. Hope, joy, peace. And this is how Jesus acted on our behalf. So we have a question, how is our action? Do we just pray and, and wait for God to deliver us an email or, or put a billboard in front of us to say, oh, that's how we're supposed to act? Now, there's a balance between uh, prayer and a time to go and a time to act. If we are in a consistent time of prayer, and reading Scripture, and seeking wise counsel, we will have the answer that requires us to move forward in faith. The timing is going to be different for all of us. Sometimes we get an answer within four hours. Sometimes it may be four months, like it was for Nehemiah. Maybe it's four years. God is preparing us, preparing those around us to work. But our actions are evidence of our faith. And the last thing that we see is that Nehemiah was faithful to serve in verses 15 through 23. It says, when our enemies heard that, that we knew their scheme and that God was, had frustrated it, every one of us returned his own work on the wall. From that day on, half of my men did the work while the other half held spears, shield, bows, and armor. The officers supported all the people of Judah who were rebuilding the wall. The laborers who carried the loads worked with one hand and held a weapon with the other. Each of the builders had his sword strapped around his waist while he was building, and the trumpeter was beside me. And I said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, the work is enormous and spread out, and we are separated far from one another along the wall. 
Wherever you hear the trumpet sound, rally to us there. Our God will fight for us. So we continued the work while half of the men were holding spears from daybreak until the stars came out. At that time, I also said to the people, let everyone and his servants spend the night inside Jerusalem so that they can stand guard by night and work by day. And I, my brothers, my servants, and the men of the guard with me never took off our clothes. Each carried his weapon, even when washing. Nehemiah was not only a leader that prayed, but he acted on behalf of the people. But he also served alongside them. Nehemiah recognized that the work was hard. It says that the, the work was enormous. But the purpose, the motivation for their endeavor and what they wanted to do was so much greater than the work ahead of them. Remember, the restoration of the wall of Jerusalem was to bring attention to God, to show Him honor, to show the glory of who God is to the nations. And ultimately, we should recognize that there's a bigger picture, a bigger story going on that fits the overall narrative of the Bible. And that is salvation. What I had shared earlier about a relationship with Jesus, well, that came through the Jews. That was the line of our Savior, Jesus. The rebuilding of the wall brought physical peace and protection. But later through Jesus, we are brought spiritual peace and protection. This was important to rebuild the wall. Nehemiah was a servant leader. We see multiple examples of how Nehemiah served alongside the people. It is interesting when you read verse 23, like, why, why is that there? What difference does it make about him wearing clothes? You know, I and I and my brothers, my servants, and the men of the guard with me never took off our clothes. Each carried his weapon when they were washing. You know, remember Nehemiah's status? He was a, he, was a, um, he, he had high, high ranking within the government. Uh, he was, uh, when they came out of Persia, they would have been uh, with an entourage. And he came with protection. And so he had the right within the hierarchy that he could say, you know what, I, I'm a mess, I'm dirty, I'm stinky. You guys keep working, I'm going to go, you know, soak in the tub or whatever. I'm going to go get cleaned up, put some fresh clothes on. He had the right to do that, but he was showing um, that we're all in this together. He was a servant willing to work alongside people. We see Jesus model this in his teaching and his ministry. In Mark 10, he says, Whoever wants to become great among you will be your servant, and whoever wants to be first among you will be a slave to all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as ransom for many. So the question is, how is our service? We have been called to go, both verbally and physically, to serve. We see it in Matthew 28, in the Great Commission. Jesus came to them and said, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. And remember, I'm with you always to the end. We see in James uh, chapter 2, verses 14 through 26, we're not going to read it all, but I would encourage you to go read that. That is a great picture of the balance between faith and works. And we don't work to gain faith, but our faith is evidence, is made evident in our work. The uh, uh, Warren Wearsby in his commentary quotes British humorist Jerome K. Jerome. And he says, uh, Jerome K. Jerome says, I like work. It fascinates me. I can sit and look at it for hours. This was not Nehemiah. This is not what we should be about. Wearsby goes on to say, he says, when it comes to the work of the Lord, there is no place for spectators or self-appointed advisors and critics. But there is always room for workers. Nehemiah was faithful to serve. Jesus was faithful to serve. We should be faithful to serve, to do our part in building up the church, building up the kingdom of God. 
Faithfulness to God is the key to a life well lived. So let's look at this example, this hero in the Old Testament of Nehemiah. One who had consistent faith. One who prayed in faith. One who acted in faith. And one who served faithfully. So how might you be challenged or encouraged today? Does your prayer life need a boost? You look at this example of Nehemiah and how he prayed and think, yeah, I, I should probably be a little more committed in my prayer time. Or is it an encouragement to keep on keeping on? Maybe it's a time uh, for you to act in faith about what God is showing or telling you. Maybe it's time to get off the bench. Maybe it's time to serve. What is it that God is telling you today about being faithful in prayer, about being faithful in your action, and about being faithful to serve? Well, today we get to celebrate. We get to celebrate several baptisms. And this is an exciting thing. This is taking that next step. So those that are being baptized, I'd invite you to uh, go ahead and get prepared. Um, and uh, we get to celebrate this as a church family. And as the, the worship team comes up, uh, I'm going to close this in prayer and we'll continue in our, our time of worship. Father, we are so thankful for, uh, again, for Nehemiah. We're thankful for uh, the story of his, um, of his faithfulness, a life that is well lived, a life that um, was marked by prayer, a life that was marked by action, and, and a life marked by service. Lord, I pray that uh, we would be faithful people. We'd remember how awesome and wonderful you are. And Lord, that we would be challenged to, uh, uh, to live a life that is honoring and glorifying to you. And we thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, let's stand together as we get to uh, just put that sermon into practice right now. As we sing these songs, just let this be your prayer. Um, that you would just cry out and say, God... Be my vision that maybe I've strayed to one way or the other, but I'm coming back to you that, uh, God, when my heart's overwhelmed, I'll trust in you alone. And so uh, as we sing these songs, maybe you just want to raise your hand, maybe you just want to close your eyes, but let this be your prayer today.
to sing this down. Christ is solid rock. Christ is solid rock. I stand. Gold of the ground is sinking sand. Gold of the ground is sinking sand. On Christ the solid rock I stand. Gold of the ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. Will you pray with me? God, thank you for this day that we get to come and celebrate the fact that all other ground is sinking sand, but you are our rock. And Lord, as we continue to celebrate with baptism, I pray that that would just sink into the depths of our soul, that you are our firm foundation, and that we would go from here ready to pray and to be obedient and to serve. In Jesus' name, amen. Man, well, as we uh, go ahead and have a seat, we got, uh, we're got going to end today with uh, our baptisms. And uh, before we do that, we just have a short little video that introduces the baptism. Baptism is a symbol of what Jesus did for us in his death, burial, and resurrection. Being lowered in the water represents our old life dying. Life dying. Just as Jesus was dead and buried, our past and future sins are gone forever. We are forgiven. We are forgiven. When we are raised out of the water, it represents our new life in Christ. Just as Jesus is resurrected, we are we are a new creation. The old is gone. New has come. New has come. Today. Today we celebrate as people at their next step. And tell the world that Jesus has brought them from death to life. To life. To life. Today we celebrate the miracle of a changed life. Based upon their profession in Jesus Christ. In the name, in the of, the name Father, of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We are buried with Christ. And raised to and walk. Raised walk. In newness of life. Newness of life. Well, we're super excited. Uh, we're going to have uh, some some other uh, of our kids are going to baptize up here in just a moment. So I want to invite up, this is Tim and Danielle, and uh, it's been awesome just getting to know them and just hearing their story of how they're wanting to publicly declare that, that Jesus is their their Savior. And they we're doing a little bit different for them today, just some uh, to do just some past medical issues and things. So um, we're super excited. So Danielle, why don't you come on over and have a seat in here. Like I said, it's a little bit different doing it this way, but um, maybe a little bit wet. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, just from hearing their story, I wish you could, uh, if you get a chance afterwards, talk to them, find out what, what Jesus has done in their life. But for today, uh, do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, a Savior of the world? Yes, I do. And have you placed your faith in trust? Jesus alone for the for the uh, saving of your sins. Yes, I have. Do you commit today in front of all these people to follow him with the rest of your life? Yes, I do. All right. Because of your profession of faith uh, in Jesus, uh, it's my privilege and honor to baptize you today in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Awesome. All right. And Tim, join her today. So go ahead and have a seat in the hot seat, wet seat. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, like I said, it's been awesome to get to know them and to hear the story. But uh, so would you say today that you believe that Jesus is the Son of God and the Savior of the world? Yes, I do. And have you placed your personal faith and trust in him for, this, for the saving work of, of saving your sins? Yes, I have. All right. And do you commit in front of all of these people to follow Jesus with the rest of your life? I do. All right. I'm super excited to be able to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Woo! <laughs> all right. 
awesome. Yeah, man. So proud of you. Yeah. All right, I'm going to turn on if uh, Heath, come on down. It's up there. We'll see if his mic is working all right. He might have to yell pretty loud if it's not working. Oh, yeah. Hey guys, so I'm Heath Honeycutt. Uh, this is my son, Obadiah. Um, he has been uh, expressing an interest for the last last few weeks here in baptism. Um, we have been praying for this for a long time, and we're just so happy that that he's uh, ready to follow Jesus now. He's, he's asked asked a lot of questions over over a number of years, and uh, so we really have have faith that he's uh, he's ready for this. And and yeah, we, without further ado. Um, Obadiah, do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God and the Savior of the world? Yes. Have you accepted him as your Lord and Savior? Yes. Are you committed to following him with the rest of your life? Yes. All right. Obadiah, I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. I get the pleasure of uh, baptizing a few of my family members today. Um, next up, we have my mom, Janice Honeycutt. Uh, she, yeah, she does not much like to be the center of attention, so this is a, <laughs> this is a big step for her. Um, she was baptized as an infant, and um, so she had gotten to uh, express her commitment to Jesus through the baptism after becoming a Christian, um, but she has been following, following for a lot of years now, and um, I was just reminded during the, the service today, um, just of, of just when they talked about faithful service um, and that, that faithfulness to God is the key to a life well lived, that uh, that's just such a, a good example of my mom here, that uh, she's been committed to this church and committed to, to the church that we went to before this for, for a lot of years and um, just had a, had a long time uh, doing Sunday school and all that and just continues to to serve. So, um, Mom, do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God and the Savior of the world? Yes. Have you accepted him as your Lord and Savior? Yes. Are you committed to following him with the rest of your life? Yes. All right. My pleasure to baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. This is my nephew, Cannon Carter. I'm um, going to get to baptize him today as well. And uh, he, he expressed an uh, interest in baptism a few months back, and he came home to the dinner table and said that he was ready to be baptized. And they, uh, you know, his parents questioned him some about it, and, and uh, he just had, had an understanding of, of what baptism was. And um, then came through the class here, and uh, we're excited to, to get to baptize him here in, in our church today. So. Uh, Canon, do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God and the Savior of the world? Yes. Have you accepted him as your Lord and Savior? Yes. Are you committed to following him with the rest of your life? Yes. All right. Canon, I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So my, my mom's going to get baptized, my niece here, um, so I'll, I'll leave it on. All right. This is my granddaughter, Sophia. Um, I'm happy to baptize her uh, since I've been baptized now. And so, Sophia, do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God and the Savior of the world? Yes. Have you accepted him as your Lord and Savior? Yes. Are you committed to following him with the rest of your life? Yes. Sophia Grace, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Oh, what a great, uh, great morning to be able to celebrate uh, these that have uh, chosen to take that next step in their faith. Um, thank you for being here this morning, and let's... Let's be a faithful people, a faithful people who, who pray, who act on uh, God moving in our life and serve. Uh, a faithful life is life well lived. So let's be faithful people. You are dismissed. Have a great rest of your Sunday. Know that you are loved.